Today is April 28th, 2017. Today we have a very special guest, my friend Devin Velasco. Devin is a graduate student at Chapman University. He studies health and strategic communication. Devin, welcome to the show. Hey, DH. Uh, thanks for having me. All right, Devin, talk to us about what health and strategic communication is. Yeah, sure. Um, so pretty much health and strategic communication, I like to think about it more as just health communication. So um, basically, like, we're looking at two different areas of study, like health and strategic communication. So I think health is kind of straightforward, like looking at how to make people healthier and improve out health outcomes. And then strategic communication is studying basically communication, but as like an academic and theoretical concept and uh, trying to understand how communication works to affect health outcomes. So that's why I kind of just call it like health communication. And that's a bigger field anyways. Um, but yeah, so we're looking at how to improve health outcomes with communication or looking at communication as the source of health disparity and how to address that to improve health outcomes. What are some direct examples that you can think of that reflect health communication as a way that people are familiar with in terms of improving health outcomes? Um, this researcher wanted to go to this village in Peru and not like a, not like a city, like a, a village kind of out in a, in a rural, rural area. And they wanted to get the villagers to start boiling their water because they're getting sick from just different things that were, because they're getting their water from a stream. So they wanted to get the villagers to boil their water um, to avoid getting sick. And the, the researcher thought it was just enough to go to this village and say, uh, you, need to boil, you need to boil, boil your water. There are germs in your water. Um, and the researcher thought that would be enough. And the vill it never caught on in that village. The villagers were super against it. And uh, so like the lesson there is that uh, the reason that we study communication is because you need to know how to basically effectively sell these ideas, not sell like for money, but convince people to do these things to improve their health because um, people aren't always going to believe you or be people are going to be resistant to certain things. And uh, but yeah, if people, some people just don't have the, the same ideas of science that we have like in the United States for um, people that don't learn those things it's going to seem it's going to be a foreign concept and uh, it's just not going to it's not going to concern them pretty much so basically the point of learning communication the communication aspect of it is to know how to actually effectively get these messages out there and make them convincing messages one example i had in mind in particular was the cigarette packaging there's there's a grotesque images of people with lung cancer, stuff like that. So that's, that's one example. So Devin, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, there's not many people coming out of the womb who want to become in the field of health communication. <laughs> Talk to us about any particular episodes um, upon birth that motivated you to pursue a, an education in health communication. Um. Yeah, I mean, I could talk about kind of my, my journey to this ma master's um, upon birth. The first job I wanted to have was I wanted to be a cowboy. So I don't know if that if that really relates to health communication. But <laughs> somewhere later on in life, um, I decided I wanted to be a doctor. And I'm, I'm actually in the process of applying to med school right now. But, um, uh, but I think like once I got into college and was doing like the pre-med stuff, I kind of realized that I needed some time before I wanted to like try to get into med school uh, to, just to mature and I think to learn more about the idea of health and how to improve health. Um, just because I don't want to be, I don't want to be a doctor that just uh, tells you tells someone what to do and then they don't do it and then what difference have I really made? I wanted to make sure that I'm I'm learning enough to be an effective doctor and even if I don't become a doctor, I just want to. Um, learn something where I can be an effective human being and helping people have better lives. So I think that was kind of the big idea behind doing this master's before I applied to medical school. Um, but I did kind of like, I kind of stumbled into it, I guess. I didn't, I didn't really have an awareness that, that this field existed. And I was just uh, at first looking at public health masters, um, trying to decide what I wanted to do before I applied to medical school. 
And Chapman is pretty close to where I'm from in Orange. So I always knew about Chapman. Um, and I just looked to see if they had public health. And then I came across their, they had the master's in health and strategic communication. And I thought, oh, that sounds interesting. And um, health is like, they had health there, you know, so it kind of caught my eye because it's not public health, it's just health, um, which sounded kind of in line with wanting to become a doctor. So I looked into it and it really sounded like, wow, this, this actually, these are skills that you could take with you into anything. But um, for me, wanting to become a doctor, these are skills that I could take with me, excuse me, with me into a practice and, uh, you know, help people have better lives, hopefully. Gotcha. Talk to us about the university. Um, for those people that are not familiar with Orange County or Chapman, what is the university like? Yeah, um, just like you said, Chapman is in the city of Orange in Orange County, uh, Southern California. It's uh, pretty relaxed. Like all the, prof- I mean, I I'm only here for a year or a little more than a year, um, so I I don't have like the full a full like four year undergrad experience um, like like a lot of people do when they go to undergrad. But um, all the professors I've come across are super nice. They're very uh, they want to work with students. They're very collaborative and uh, it's not rigid or formal, which fosters a really great learning environment. And there's so much opportunity for students to get involved on different projects, which is really nice. Um, The school is on the smaller side. It's a private school. Uh, And (laughs) coming from uh, undergrad in the Midwest, people dress a lot better here and uh, look a lot healthier. (laughs) But it's just uh, it's a pretty relaxed um, vibe about the place and it's re- it's really nice it's, the buildings are pretty new looking so it's just really nice and um, but it is it's a little weird it's like completely surrounded by the city of orange so comparing that to undergrad where the school is kind of in a bubble and like immediately surrounding the school was just kind of space here it's like you cross the street and you're surrounded by houses and um, different businesses and stuff so it's pretty interesting I think the it has, it's kind of forced to have more interaction with the city of Orange than maybe some other colleges who can be self-contained. Would you recommend prospective students to consider applying to Chapman for undergrad or graduate studies? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, I think for people considering where they want to go, if, I mean, you, you have to look at like what kind of school works for you. If if you're like, if you work well in a, a big school with tons of people, big classrooms, uh, then this is not the place for you if you want just like bigger numbers wise. But if you, and I, that works for some people and um, there's no right or wrong to what works for you, but for, for people that work better in more intimate sized classrooms, so smaller classrooms where they can get more one-on-one, uh, more face time with a professor, this would probably be the school for them, I would I would think. Um, and uh, the one great thing, though, no matter like what kind of learning style works for you, is that there's a lot of opportunity here, um, and not just from the school, which is that part's great. Um, how just how much you can do in like what kind of research or jobs and things you could get on campus, but also because, like I mentioned, where the Chapman's so entangled with the city of Orange, there's like there's just a lot of opportunity in Southern California and you're kind of like right in a really convenient place in Southern California between LA and San Diego. Um, and there's a lot of jobs in Orange too and opportunity. So it's pretty, it's pretty, it's a good place. You mentioned the city of Orange and the campus vibe being relaxed. And in fact, your voice got much more relaxed since the last time I've spoken to you. So that's, it's, it's kind of an interesting phenomenon. Devin, I wanted to talk to you about how you stumbled upon wanting to become a doctor because you mentioned you wanted to use your graduate studies as time to reflect and a stepping stone for ultimately medical school. Let's talk about your foundational goals of wanting to become a doctor. Yeah. uh, So I think throughout school, I really, I really loved, or I still do. I love being in school. I love learning. Uh, So I think once I got into high school and started thinking more about where my future could go. Um, I was thinking about like what subjects do I like, and I really like. I mean, I like like all the subjects, but I was really interested in science. And uh, then when I was a freshman in high school, my grandma got cancer, 
and she's she's better now, thankfully. But at the time, it was uh, it was pretty devastating. I'm really close with my grandma, so um, I was like, oh, I want to be an oncologist, and that way I could help people like my grandma, um, you know, battle cancer. So I think that's uh, what I wanted to do at first was be an oncologist, so a cancer doctor for people that aren't familiar with the term. Um, and then once I got into college and explored, like did a lot more shadowing and working in hospitals, then I, I kind of thought, well, maybe not just, on, I still am thinking about oncology, but I think I'd be happy being any sort of doctor, really. So I kind of brought in my, like I, I would I would do most, I think, specialties, but still very interested in oncology and now uh, emergency too. I really liked, I worked a lot in emergency rooms and I really liked it and had really great shadowing experiences. Um, and then that kind of like how, so what made me think towards the end of college of being like, it's not enough to want to be a doctor. I also like, I want to improve um, how effective I can be. And I think what made me really conceptualize like, I don't just have to be a doctor, but whatever I do, I want it to be improving, improving like people's health to, as a way to like improve people's happiness is like, um, my cousin, when my cousin passed away during college and she was, she was like a health inspector. Um, so I think that, that kind of, once she passed away, uh, it kind of made me think like, okay, you need to get down to business and really, um, try to be an, an effective person. So I think that was really sad but also um, inspiring do you think that your graduate studies at chapman would influence you to direct yourself to a particular profession within medicine um like a particular specialty yeah yeah um well i guess i think they would work across the board i think uh a lot of what we study is creating effective health messages. So, I mean, I think it would work. You, you could take a lot of what you learn and take it into like a, like a family practice or a general practitioner, like a, like the doctor you just go to on a regular basis or from like a, like a regular kind of doctor or a pediatrician or something. Cause then um, you could really do a good job with all that, that knowledge of how to create effective messaging. But I mean, it's such a health, communication is such a broad topic because it's really communication to apply to any area of health you could think of. So um, I've been lucky enough for this master's to do a lot of the projects that I've done throughout the year that I've been here. I've been looking at e emergency room medicine. So it's it's really like wherever you want to take it. Um, it's, yeah, so I think you it really could do, maybe not like, it wouldn't really help you for surgery because <laughs> we're not learning how to do surgery or, um, and then people are like, you know, like knocked out for surgery. So you're not going to be trying to give them health messages while you're giving them surgery. So maybe not that, but definitely anything where you have like a lot of patient interaction it will be helpful. Gotcha. You mentioned working on some interesting projects during school. Talk to us about one of your favorite projects you worked on on campus. Yeah. Um, so I think my favorite one is actually the one I'm working on now. And, uh, well, yeah, I'm still working on it now, but it was like the seeds for it have been going on throughout my whole entire time here. Um, and it's looking at how to get people to ask more questions when they're, they're in the emergency room. Um, so I've done, been doing a lot of research and a lot of research shows that, uh, when people, when people go to the emergency room and then they leave, uh, if they don't understand what they're supposed to do once they leave, like what treatment plans they're supposed to take or, um, what they need to do to take care of themselves and avoid coming back to the emergency room for the same reason or what kind of follow-up they need. Uh, if they don't understand that, then they end up coming back to the emergency room for the same reason. And um, that's a really avoidable and really costly thing. And emergency rooms are super overburdened as it is. Um, and yeah, so it's I'm trying to look at this as a way to help kind of alleviate some of that burden in the emergency room. I want to get people to ask more questions uh, because we see also in the research that when people ask more questions, they're more likely to have a better understanding of what they're supposed to do and then they're less likely to come back. So this is one avenue to try to get people to not come back for unnecessary reasons. But it also means they're going to be healthier because they don't get to the point where they have to come back. Um, so I'm looking at uh, the intervention to implement into like emergency room waiting rooms to help get 
to enc help encourage that, to help patients ask more questions. And right now, I'm, I'm looking at trying to get it into a local hospital um, to like really test it out. I've done some message testing, but it's for certain things really hard to test messages like hypothetically. Um, and it, for this, I think I just need to try to get into an emergency room and really see if it has an effect. Um, and I mean, the incentive for a hospital to undertake this sort of project is one, it would be free because I'd be doing it. Um, and it's not going to take any way of their res any of their resources away, but also it um, more, uh, more research shows that like with these kind of things, their uh, satisf patient satisfaction improves and patient satisfaction is one part of how hospitals get their funding. So that's kind of what I'm still, I've been working on a lot, still working on it and going to work on it through the summer uh, and we finish our program in July. So I guess I have till July to try to make this happen. <laughs> It's got to happen, and the audience is going to hold you accountable, so no pressure. <laughs> yeah, thanks, audience. <laughs> Devin, we're going to be talking about um, what your interview process was like. Uh, there's going to be people interested in graduate school, and not every university is going to be the same. Not every program is going to be the same. So we want to talk specific uh, to you and your experience applying to Chapman for the graduate program. Talk to us about your interview experience going beyond the traditional stuff that people can look up online. Yeah. Um, so kind of like what you said, every school is going to be a little different, uh, the process that you go through. But the, I guess in general, the nice thing about uh, grad school interviews is, or this process of applying to grad school is that it's like way less rigidly uniform than applying to undergrad. You apply to undergrad, everybody pretty much has the same process. Like you're going to do the applications, maybe have an interview and then that's it for grad school. Um, because it's, it's really about just who the schools want. The, the process can look different within the same applicant, same application cycle for all the applicants at school. Like some people can get interviews. Some people can, um, get a decision early. Uh, some people don't have to turn in or don't have to show a, a, a GRE, the graduate like standardized exam score. Some people do. So it's really, it's more, it's, I think they look way more at the person uh, when you apply to grad school. And I think they don't, someone, someone put it this way, like when it's good to have rules and, and stuff set in place, especially thinking about applying to school to make it standard and fair. But, uh, it's also like we're humans and we have the ability to critically think about things. And I think that's kind of what it's more like applying to grad school. It's like the, the people that are looking at your application, they, I think, more critically think about things and they look at the bigger picture and um, can reason about if they want you or not. But, but so my process, sorry, that was a kind of a little bit of a tangent, but my process of uh, applying was, I was looking at public health masters and if you're applying to public health uh, masters, there's a it's sort of, it's like a common app style thing, but for public health masters. Um, so there, I applied to, well, I started applying to a lot of schools on that and then applied to other schools that weren't on like the, the public health common app thing. Um, and really my top two choices though were Notre Dame and, uh, and Chapman, which aren't public health schools, so they're not on the public health common app. Notre Dame was global health, and then Chapman is the, the health and strategic communication. And, um, and anyway, I got into the Notre Dame Masters, and I got into the Chapman Masters, so I didn't actually finish any of my other applications <laughs> because those were my, my top two. Um, so once I got into those, I didn't really see a need to finish the other ones, but the other ones I applied to were like um, USC, or I almost finished applying to were USC and some Florida schools and um, some schools in the East and some Chicago schools, I think. Um, but yeah, so for Notre Dame, because I was going to Notre Dame in undergrad, um, I was able to get an early decision for that because I, I was just there already and um, went in for an interview, um, did my GRE and you know the essays and turned in my resume and everything. And then they, the interview was a lot about like why I want to do the master's and what I'm going to do with it. And uh, I think when you're doing that sort of interview, you need to be really sincere, but you also really need to, if you want to go to grad school, you need to want to go to grad school. Like 
you shouldn't be applying to grad school if you're doing it just because you feel like you have to. It's because once you get to that level, people are there because they want to be there and because they want to learn. It's not, it's not like a case of you're there because you have to be and you're just doing what you, what you need to do to get the grade. Um, they really expect people there to be there because they want to learn and learn to not just get the grade, but to like know these things and um, have a good command of them. So, and I think that is really transparent in an inter in an interview. I think they they're good at seeing who's there for sincere reasons and who's there for just because they're being forced to be there. Um, but for Chapman, that one I didn't have to interview, um, which was good because I was still in Indiana my senior year of college. Uh, but yes, yeah, so I just did the app and turned in my uh, GRE score for that one too. But I think Chapman is one school that doesn't require the GRE, but I would strongly recommend uh, people, if they're applying to grad school, to take the GRE just because if there's any anything like lacking in your application, a really good GRE school, score is going to like really make up for that. Um, yeah, so that was my... And then I don't, I don't know if you want to know like how I ended up choosing between the Notre Dame Masters and the Chapman Masters, but I could tell you that too. Please talk talk about it with us. <laughs> um, so, well, I think now that I'm able to have some like time removed back, or now that I've, because I think uh, the Chapman Masters, I was a little more confused about going in, like what exactly it was going to entail. And so I think now that I've been through most of the program, I can see now that it lines up a little bit more with wanting to be a doctor. Um, that's not to say I think the global health would have also been help, uh, helpful too and knowledge that I could t could take with me in the future. But um, I don't think I really want to work on those bigger kinds of projects like what they would teach you in global health. I think if I have a, a good understanding of what, what people are learning in the global health program, but a lot of it also came down to um, cost at the time, like staying out in Indiana and having to pay for like living expenses and the program was more expensive um, compared to coming back here, get being able to live at home, which would save a lot of money and the program was a lot less expensive. So that was a, a big factor in that decision. But I think once I made the decision, I realized that it was, it was the right decision. Like I ended up where I needed to be and um, found a lot more opportunities outside of school back in California to get more hospital experience and, uh, so it's, it definitely worked out. Devin, talk to us about some of the interview questions that Notre Dame asked when you were there. Yeah, um, I'm trying to remember. The big ones were why I wanted to do the program and then what I thought the program entailed and like what it would teach me. So you need to have a, a good grasp of what the program's about because they're going to, it's pretty likely that they're going to ask you what you think the program's about. Um, they will ask you about, or they asked me, I guess, about what I wanted to do with with that knowledge in the future after I, if I did the program after I would graduate from that program. Um, and they asked about, like, what I did in undergrad, uh, major wise and why. And I can't really remember much else. From the interview. Gotcha. What do you think it is that the interviewers uh, looked at in Devin and said, wow, we need to get him? <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know if they <laughs> felt the, the wow, we need to get him. Well, who knows? Um, I think my, well, I think that my GRE score was like a good attention grabber. Um, in my in my application, I did pretty well on it. Uh, so I think that that was like a first, like, oh, we'll we'll look at his application a little more closely based on this number. And then uh, I think the essay probably really, if you could write a, if you could write well, you can do anything. And <laughs> if you can write well on the application on your app, your essays. For an application, I think it it helps them feel like they can get to know you as a as a person, 
want to find out more about you. So I would say those two things. And I did English in, in college, so I think that was really helpful because it, it gets you used to being able to write. Um, so I think, yeah, I would say thanks to my GRE score and my application. Gotcha. We're going to talk about your peers, basically the students that you worked with and studied with. Uh, talk to us about where they came from, what were they like, were they similar to you in terms of background? Uh, so actually we have a pretty wide range of like people's experience in the experiences in like coming to the program. Uh, a lot of people went to Chapman for undergrad though and then they, they stayed there and I think that's probably because Chapman does this 4 plus 1 program which I haven't seen in too many other places. It's pretty unique, and I think it's a really good idea and a good selling point for people in a, who are like considering where to go for undergrad and thinking like they already know that they want to go on to like high, like education past undergrad. But so what four plus one is like when you're when they applied to Chapman, they also applied to four plus one, which is they um, if they get accepted to Chapman applying to the four plus one, they're also automatically guaranteed a spot for uh, for the master's program once they graduate. So that's why it's four plus one. So you do your four years of undergrad, then plus the one, and then you have two degrees from that school. Um, but you're already guaranteed to have that that one year of master's. And then, um, so yeah, so a lot of people are did that and are from Chapman. Um, so there's 11 of us in the cohort. So the, co the cohort is like people we start with. Uh, and three of us did it in a year. Um, and then the rest of the people are in the four plus one. So they either like, they're either in their second year because they, or not second year, but like four plus one people were able to start on the courses in their undergrad, which is really helpful because it makes it a lot cheaper. But um, they also, which it also means like they spread it out over two years, um, which is probably has its own challenges because they, they had to start taking graduate level courses while they were doing their senior year and still had undergrad classes so that sounds challenging in its own way um, but yeah so there's people that are in their like second year kind of a four plus one who are also graduating with us who did it in one year and then there's people that um, are like technically seniors so they're going to finish next year uh, so we won't graduate with them and then some there's some people that uh, took like a a break after undergrad before applying to to grad school, and I think I think there's only like two or three of us though that um, came from different school from a different school to Chapman. Devin, what most people don't realize is that graduate school is a full time occupation. The problem with a lot of our audience is that because it is a full time occupation. They want to gain appropriate levels of conviction that this is the right field of study for them. In your perspective, what are some early on experiences that people can get where they can pretty much get a feel for what health communication is like so that when they apply for health communication, they can go into the interview and confidently say, okay, this is exactly what I want because I've had XYZ experience. I guess depending on where you go for undergrad, you can major in in communication or something to do with communication if you're already interested in that. And I'm and I think once you do that, you'll have a pretty good understanding of uh, what a like master's or even PhD in health communication would be like, because then you're just applying what you learned in communication to the broad field of health. But uh, other than that, you could you could always ask to shadow uh, a grad course, and people do do that. Um, I think if in undergrad, if someone told me that, I would be a little bit doubtful, but people have come to, a, quite a good number of people have come to my classes and sat in on a class and just, um, and shadowed to see what it's, what the, what a class is like. And I think that's a really good idea because it is different. Um, there's a lot more of an expectation for everybody to be involved in the class and making it a good class. Um, so it's not just professors. I mean, you, you will have lectures, but a lot of it is going to be discussion and you're going to be expected to be a part of that discussion, not just for like a participation grade, but because that's the expectation 
um, in grad school, you're there to learn and you should be involved and uh, just read research that's out there and see what the kinds of things that people are doing and see if it interests you. Um, I think that's a really good idea because you don't need to have like a super in-depth understanding to feel it out if you read um, research, like health communication research. So yeah, just like looking that kind of stuff up would be good. And sometimes there's really nice people out there where if you shoot them emails and ask them about, you know, what they study in, if it, if it's fun or not, you can kind of gauge based on conversation or just email exchanges whether or not this might be a right fit. And as I'm talking to you right now, I'm getting the feeling that health communication is not the right field for me as I'm speaking to you. So this is a really beneficial experience for me too. Uh, just really quick, now that you said that, it totally reminded me. But yeah, uh, if for the listeners out there who are interested in some any topic in grad school, definitely email a professor in a program that you're interested in, or even the director of the program because they are like from personal experience they're super accommodating they they would love to talk to you and talk it th through with you and see is it the right fit for you because um, they yeah they they are always open to for people who are considering it they would love to talk to you so definitely don't be afraid to get in touch with any professors or the directors of any programs for sure Sounds great. Devin, we're going to um, do a challenge. Okay. Because you majored health communication, we're going to ask you to do a challenge for us, which is to tell the audience a message about health that you'd like to tell them. <laughs> what do you mean a message about <laughs> health? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, just tell them something that they should do to be healthy or any health related message that you'd like to get out there any health oh vaccinate your children <laughs> that's that's my that's a big cuz yeah you should also vaccinate yourself not just your children but yeah you should get your vaccinations because the uh, the science and i know you can't see this but i'm doing the the air quotes the science that said vaccinations are linked to autism was completely faked, and people know it's faked. Um, and the guy like lost his license and his credibility for faking that research article. But yeah, vaccinations will not give you autism, and they will help you not die or lose your legs. <laughs> Thanks for answering that challenge in a very serious manner. We try to spice it up a little bit at Labor Studios and try to you know, do a little bit of challenges that pertain to people's occupation. So that was really cool. Thanks, Devin. Oh, thank you. Yeah, sorry. I don't think it was very spicy, but <laughs> but thank you. Spicy enough. Devin, we can't thank you enough for joining us today. Some of the audience tuning in will identify their passion with your occupation and pursue that as a goal. And that's always a great feeling to be having. Now, if you could give one final message to those people wanting to become a student in graduate studies in health communication, what would that be? Don't procrastinate. <laughs> do everything, do your things early. It'll be, it'll save you so much grief. It'll, it'll save you late nights questioning whether you're cut out to be in school still. <laughs> so don't procrastinate. But also, don't, don't sweat it. If you, if you want to be a, a grad student in health communication or anything, if you want to be a grad student for anything, uh, work hard, but don't don't freak out. You'll make it through. You'll make it through for sure. Um, just have fun and enjoy being enjoy getting to be in college a little longer. And vaccinations. And yeah, get vaccinated, or else uh, polio might come back. It's almost there. It's almost at the uh, at the threshold where it can come back because so many people aren't vaccinated for polio. That's how Michael Jackson's mom had polio. Wow, I'm learning new things every day. Thank you, Devin. Talk to you soon. <laughs> Thanks, DH. It was good talking to you.